Lucky Land Casino asking people what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? Lucky? In line at the deli, I guess? Aha, in my dentist's office. More than once, actually. Do I have to say? Yes, you do. In the car before my kids' PTA meeting. Really? Yes. Excuse me, what's the weirdest place you've gotten lucky? I never win and tell. Well, there you have it. You can get lucky anywhere, playing at LuckyLandSlots.com. Play for free right now. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus. Terms and conditions apply. See website for details. This podcast contains adult themes and language, and some of the things that we discuss may be disturbing to some listeners. In this podcast, we discuss sexual assault, torture, race, and murder. Listener discretion is advised. Please take care of yourself. Welcome to Fruit Loops, episode 224. Bui Tibi Nafi and Bienvenidos Bitches. And thank you so much for listening and for being here. Yeah. Now, Fruit Loops is a podcast about true crimes committed by people of color and those who are othered and the victims because contrary to popular belief, not all serial killers are straight, cisgendered, able-bodied, white dudes. Amen. <laughs> That's right. And these crimes rarely get much public attention because the news is racist. And I'm supposed to say allegedly, but I don't mean it. <laughs> it's ironic. <laughs> she's saying it ironically. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank that's my friend over there. She's yeah, she's she's up to speed. And we are Wendy and Beth. She's Wendy, a black Latinx woman. And I'm Beth, and I just happen to be white. That's right. We're not journalists, investigators, or psychologists. Just a couple of gals interested in true crime. Also, the opinions expressed in this podcast are just that, our opinions. Well, um, before we get into it, who are we talking about today, Beth? Today we're talking about Hubert Geralds Jr., a.k.a. the Englewood Strangler, who was responsible for the murders of five women and the attempted murder of another between 1994 and 1995, in Chicago, Illinois. Shot town. Show us how you get down. We'll get into all the ins and outs of Chicago in this case. But before yes. we do, how you doing? Hey, guess what? What? Chicken I'm butt. I'm tired. Uh, <laughs> you don't say. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's true. Yeah, yeah, me too. I could use some Ozempic, some methamphetamines, anything to keep me going <laughs> throughout the day right now. Woo. <laughs> um, it's so weird when I'm really tired I, I and I get up early in the morning to start my day. It's like 4.30 and uh, I'm like, my bed sounds so nice. But then I go to bed at 10.30 and I can't fall asleep. You can't sleep. Oh, yeah. I hate it. It's so dumb. <laughs> no, it's the worst. It is the worst. I'm sorry you're tired, friend. I hope I hope you'll get some dates of rest coming up soon. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I have a vacation coming up. Oh, so do you now? That'll be good. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have no vacations because I think vacation's stupid. But yes. um, it is Black History Month, and I'm just savoring these last few days, gonna get every last drop out of it. And it's a leap year, so we get an extra day, y'all. Beep, 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 beep. Yeah, awesome. <laughs> yeah. So let's get into some listener letters. All right. Well, hello, angels. Thank you. Ah, what's in that bag, Beth? Well, I wanted to say thank you to Tina mm. for your wonderful email and show suggestions. Oh, yes, yes, yes. Add it to the list. Yeah. Hello. Yeah, your email made my day. Really. <laughs> yeah, I'm, 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 yeah, seriously, <laughs> I saw it and I, I had to like, do a couple breathing exercises because it was like 
again, these you guys, your messages hit at the right time. Yeah, they After, really do. Yeah, we must have got bombarded pretty recently with these ladies are racist. These yeah. girls are they're shrill cunts. I don't know. The people say it's, really mean things. Yeah, and awful. so. Tina, your message was so well received. Thank you so, so yes. much. So hip hop air horns for Miss Tina, for Mama Tina. Uh, huh? And if you have any questions or comments, please send them to fruitloopspod at gmail.com or leave us a voicemail at 602-935-6294. And we may feature it on a future episode. But then again, if you don't want us to, just tell us and we won't. Yeah. That's all you have to do. Just tell us. Just tell us. Yeah. Also, we don't have any new Patreons this week, but we recently we had our this weekend our Fruit Loops Happy Hour. And it was oh, yeah. a lot of fun for our five dollars and up Patreons who if you go on down there, you get bonus episodes, ad free content. And the chance to hang out with us once a month. Yeah. Let's see. Oh, well, uh, it looks like it's break time. So we're (laughs) going to take a quick little break and get back to the story when we come back. This episode is brought to you by BetterHelp. What's the first thing you'd do if you had an extra hour a day? Hmm. Spend more time with your kids, go to the Hmm. gym, Hmm. work on a hobby, take a nap. (laughs) Can you do all those things in 60 minutes? Just kidding. (laughs) You know, a lot of us spend our lives wishing we had more time. But what we do with that time, we don't always know. But the best way to squeeze that special thing into your schedule is to know what it is. And therapy can help you figure that out. Find what matters to you most and make it a priority so that you can find the time to do more of it. Yeah. Therapy isn't just for those who've experienced major trauma. It's for everyone. Mm -hmm. It can empower you to be the best version of yourself. And I've been in and out of therapy most of my life. Same. And it has had such a positive influence on my life that I honestly do not know who I would be without therapy. And I don't want to (laughs) know. I don't want to know either. (laughs) Listen, Beth and I have both used BetterHelp. Yeah. And we love it. And if you are thinking of starting therapy, you should give BetterHelp a try. It is entirely online and designed to be convenient, flexible, and suited to your schedule. Just fill out a brief questionnaire to get matched with a licensed therapist. You can also switch therapists at any time for no additional charge. Learn to make time for what makes you happy with BetterHelp. Visit BetterHelp.com slash fruit today to get 10% off your first month. That's BetterHelp. H-E-L-P dot com slash fruit. It is Ryan here, and I have a question for you. What do you do when you win? Like, are you a fist pumper? A woohooer, a hand clapper, a high fiver. I kind of like the high five, but if you want to hone in on those winning moves, check out Chumba Casino. At chumbacasino.com, choose from hundreds of social casino style games for your chance to redeem serious cash prizes. There are new game releases weekly, plus free daily bonuses. So don't wait. Start having the most fun ever at chumbacasino.com. No purchase necessary. DTW, void, were prohibited by law. See terms and conditions 18. Plus. And we're back. Remind us, Beth, who is our subject today? Our subject today is Hubert Geralds Jr., a.k.a. the Anglewood Strangler, who murdered five women between December 1994 and June 1995 in Chicago. All right. So let's get into the love and light section where we just say to those members of the Englewood and Chicago community who were touched by this tragic case, Just we want to wish you love and light and healing energy and to the family and loved ones of the victims. Same healing energy, love and light to y'all. And we also want to say rest in paradise to the queens whose lives were cut too short. This is one of those cases I personally found it very difficult to find information about the victims. Yeah. So if you have any information to shed light on their lives and spirits, please share with us. You know where to find us. Yeah. So rest in paradise to Rhonda King, who was 18 years old at the time of her death. Dorothea Withers was 37 years old when her life was ended. Alanda Tart was 23 years old when she was killed. Joyce Wilson was 28 years old. Millicent Jones was 25 years old. Mary Blackman was 42. Lovey Ford was 26 years old at the time of her death. And Clashawn Hopes 
was 25 years old and Clashon survived her attack. So let's get into the setting because cultural and historical context is important. Okay. So what do you got for us, Beth? Take us there. Well, the setting is the Chicago neighborhood of Englewood, which is located on the south side. Chicago is built on land that was home to various Native American tribes for hundreds of years. The area is the traditional homelands of the Ojibwe, Odawa, and Potawatomi nations. Many other nations consider this area their traditional homeland, including the Miamia, Ho-Chunk, Menomini, Sac and Fox, Peoria, Kaskaskia, Wea, Kickapoo, and Maskoutin. In the 1770s, the first permanent non-Indigenous settler came to Chicago, and it was a Black man named Jean-Baptiste Pointe de Sable, who is now recognized as the city's founder. His wife was a Potawatomi woman named Kitty Hawa. Ah, now the area of Englewood was annexed. And I hate that word because it makes it sound like, oh, they just like knocked on the door and let them in. <laughs> but that's not how annexation <laughs> works. It's not. It's, <laughs> it's violent, y'all. So the area of Englewood was annexed by the city of Chicago in 1889. And the earliest European settlers to Englewood were German and Irish immigrants working on the railroads and at the stockyard. Horse car lines connected Englewood to downtown Sha Town, followed by electric trolleys in 1896 and the elevated line in 1907. You know, that famous one we see in every show that's yeah. set in Chicago. Yeah, that's the crazy. L. 1907. Yeah, I didn't realize it was that old, but that's pretty That dope. early, yeah. Yeah. In the late 19th and early 20th century, Englewood's East Hill in the first and second wards became home to the world's leading industrialists and bankers. At the same time, working and middle-class Southern Black migrants slash American refugees and Jewish, Italian, and Irish immigrants settled in the city's third and fourth wards. The fourth ward, then known as Little Texas, had a mix of Black, Italian, and Jewish business owners and mostly Black residents. It was home to at least six churches, numerous lodges, scores of Black-owned businesses, and amateur and semi-pro baseball teams like the Inglewood Cubs. And I will just have to say, um, I don't know if anybody out there listening has ever heard of Dr. Umar. Do you know who Dr. Umar is, Beth? No. So he's a PhD. He is a, some would say, a thought leader in the Black community. Some would okay. say a troll. Mm. But Dr. Umar has some interesting views, but some of his views I do think are like, they, to me, they make sense. Like one of the things he says is that for a community to be able to sustain itself, it needs these things, churches, businesses, banks, schools, et cetera, to thrive. Right. And it sounds like this community that had been excluded by the dominant caste or classes in um, the Chicago area did something wonderful for themselves. Yeah. Yeah. And the residents of Little Texas found work building the mansions on the East Hill and in various service jobs, such as domestics, chauffeurs and gardeners, and as small business owners. By 1920, the population of Englewood had grown to about 87,000, and Englewood Shopping District was the second busiest in the city. By 1930, Englewood had a Black population close to 3,000. In the 1930s, in the wake of the Great Depression, the Hill's wealthy white elite, who had instigated the demand for Black domestic labor, mm. organized a campaign to depopulate the fourth ward of its Black residents. The depopulation campaign became known as the, quote, Negro Purge, unquote. That's horrible. Yeah. Uh, I yeah. Want, it makes me want to barf. Yeah. Yeah, the, the dehumanization of people who are not white in this country is... It, it, Gross. It, yeah. It, I want to say it surprises me, but it doesn't. It just makes me mad. And now I'm sweating. So after, yeah. <laughs> again, the dominant class, the white dominant class had actively excluded these people after they had built something wonderful for themselves and they destroyed it. Um, Hill residents began to refer to the men and women who drove their cars, tended their gardens, cleaned their houses and raise their children as, quote, unquote, a menace. What the fuck? <laughs> then do yeah. it yourself. <laughs> yeah. I was fine over there. But this Negro, quote, unquote, menace 
they said had brought crime, disease, and slum conditions to Englewood and threatened the peace of its respectable white citizens. And that's not true. That's propaganda. Yeah. That's white supremacy. And there's a lot of systems that contribute to that perpetuation of the message, which makes it hard for people to combat. Yeah, and these these people were not as well off as the people who lived on the hill Mm -mm. because they didn't get paid as much. Hello, they're doing these jobs for these people. Right, yeah, exactly. And again, I think that's by design. You're capitalizing on the cheap labor of people of a lower caste. I hate capitalism so much. (laughs) (laughs) It just it blows my mind how they they pay these people so little Mm -hmm. and then blame them for their own poverty. Yeah. And it really isn't that different. You know, these these nice white people on the hill probably thought, oh, we're giving them jobs. Right. And we get something wonderful out of it, too. And it kind of reminds me of like today, Amazon, right? Amazon employs a lot of people, but they don't treat them very well. Meanwhile, yeah. all of us are getting our packages lickety split, you know, yeah. things we don't yeah. even need. And we all are sort of unconsciously contributing to participating in capitalizing on the labor of human beings in our communities. So just something to think about. It hasn't changed. It just looks a little different. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So the city's health department imposed humiliating health exams on black female domestics, Mm. accused them of bringing disease into the homes (gasps) of Hill families, and the city building inspectors aggressively condemned homes rented and owned by black families. Wow. Do you see how intentional this is? Yes. It's it's horrifying. Yeah. But the Negro purge failed in the face of fierce resistance by the residents of Little Texas, who, emboldened by the New Deal housing laws, fought to get a 100-family low-income public housing complex built in the Fourth Ward. They called for the units to be reserved primarily for black families native to Inglewood. However, another side effect of the New Deal was redlining. Redlining is the practice of determining eligibility for loans based on geographic location. It's rooted in racial discrimination and furthering segregation. During the Great Depression, President Franklin Delano, I always thought it was Delanor, but it's Delano? Yeah, I think so. Oh, I don't know. I don't know. I don't know. (laughs) (laughs) And I don't care because I know people think he did a really great thing. President Franklin D. Roosevelt uh, seeking to stabilize the real estate industry and boost home ownership, created Home Owners Loan Corporation, H O L C for short, and the Federal Housing Authority, F H A. But don't get it twisted. The New Deal by design was meant to exclude Black people from these benefits. Yeah. H O L C was a temporary agency designed to refinance home mortgages and to standardize the home appraisal processes. The FHA's task was to regulate interest rates and mortgage terms. Such roles, though highly beneficial to the real estate sector and the national economy, would soon be weaponized to further segregate Chicago and the nation. And the New Deal, what else happened in the New Deal? People, the VA, VA loans, um, vets could come home and go to school. Black people couldn't. Vets could come home and buy homes. Black people couldn't. There were benefits for um, people. I think Social Security was created. Yeah. And FDR's administration excluded agricultural and domestic workers from Mm. that program. And guess who occupied most of those jobs? Anyway. That's pretty fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. America. So to create standards in the home appraisal process, HOLC emphasized neighborhood stability as their desired outcome and followed the then-prevailing white theory that mixing races harmed home values and neighborhood quality. Mmm, sad face. (laughs) HOLC and the FHA mapped and divided almost every American city into zones. These zones were based on the descriptions of HOLC and FHA field agents who were white Mm -hmm. (laughs) and who worked in conjunction with the real estate industry. I'm just thinking if they can divide every American home into zones, I'm sure they can figure out what Black and Indigenous people are owed for the stolen land, lives lost, and free labor. (laughs) Thank you. Um, Anyway, the map's purpose was to give the federal government assessments of home lending risk. The higher rated the zone, the less risky the loan, and the more likely a home buyer would be able to borrow. Neighborhoods were graded A through D and color-coded. Green or A grade meant best and safest. Blue or B grade meant still safe. 
Yellow or C grade meant riskier, and red or D grade meant very risky. Any neighborhood with at least 10% Black residents was graded red, D, or redlined. Englewood was therefore redlined. And the realtors and the banks were all in on this system. Yeah. And still are to this day, by the way. Navy Federal got popped for not giving home loans to Black people just two weeks ago. Wow. And uh, they profited off of the racist fears of, quite frankly, ignorant white folks in the area and the American dreams of Black people. They exploited everybody, everybody's yeah. fears and hopes and desires. And by the 1960s, after experiencing white flight, Englewood became a predominantly Black neighborhood. Oh, hey! What's this? A culture corner. (laughs) Welcome to Culture Corner with Wendy and Beth. So just a couple points about Chi-Town's history that I think are relevant to the story. So anybody ever heard of police commander John Burge? Talked about him before. On when we whenever we cover Chicago cases, he comes up. Yeah, but he comes up. (laughs) But between 1972 (laughs) and 1991, Burge or Berg was the police commander, and he was the leader of a group of police officers known by various names, including the Midnight Crew. Burge's ass kickers and the A team. Mm. And they abused suspects to coerce confessions. Mm. And most of the suspects were black and brown men confessed to these crimes under duress. The torture included, but was not limited to, beating, uh, suffocating, burning their skin, and using electric shock on their genitals. And there are at least 118 victims of this illegal, violent, and mostly racist police gang. Gross. And then recently, I was listening to the Criminal Podcast. Oh, I love that podcast. Episode. I do, too. Phoebe Judge, we be my best friend. Anyway, <laughs> I already have a best friend, and her name is Beth. So. But um, they had an episode called Call Russ Ewing, and he was a reporter in Chicago beginning in 1975, and he convinced a murder suspect to surrender to the police, and then he just kept doing it. And he helped facilitate as many as 115 surrenders. Suspects and their families would ask, get me Russ to ensure the safety Mm. in the hands of police custody because police were taking these people, giving them the Berg treatment, beating them up, confession, case closed. And everybody knew this was wrong. And so Russ was like, let me get them on camera. Let me let me look at them to make sure that they are safe from there to police custody. And if we see any bruises on them after the fact, then we'll know it was police police brutality. Right. This was a way to prevent police fuckery. And so Russ That's helped awesome. a lot of people. Also, interesting thing about Russ is he interviewed John Wayne Gacy in 1980 oh, wow. and identified one of his or helped identify one of his victims. So, wow. Yes. That's crazy. So yeah. I'm done. Go ahead. <laughs> By the 1990s, there were a lot of abandoned buildings in Englewood, and Chicago was in the middle of an unprecedented crime wave. Chicago's community policing program, the Chicago Alternative Policing Strategy, or CAPS, started as a pilot program in five of the 25 police districts in Chicago, Englewood, Marquette, Austin, Morgan Park, and Rogers Park. CAPS is based on the idea that communities should be a partner with the police to prevent and reduce crime in Chicago's neighborhood. Nice idea, but, yeah, you know, uh, the goal was to get police officers out of their squad cars to walk the streets and, you know, get to know the residents. Yeah, sounds good, right? Mm, not from what I know about <laughs> Chicago police, it is not. <laughs> the program was far from perfect. The community still felt unheard. And despite the fact that police were aware as early as 1992 that a serial killer, and there were actually two of them, was walking the streets of Englewood, they did not inform the residents. Oh, wonderful. So all that was for nothing. But I will say (laughs) it is another thing that's by design is that uh, the powers that be will want us to think that like communities don't know. policing. Yeah, Mm -hmm. yeah. Or that communities don't know what's best for themselves. Or right. can't do it. The problem is just so big. You can't. You, it's never going to get fixed. But they want us to think that. So we won't try. So just yeah. wanted to say this program wasn't perfect. But there are other really great programs in cities like Chicago and others around it where the communities who are the most affected, they're doing what they can to keep themselves safe. Yeah, I think they just didn't. Um, th- they didn't implement it. Correctly. It was a bad idea to partner with the police, I think, at that time. At that time. Yeah. yeah. We all know better now and we can do better, right? Yeah. America's perfect, right? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> so let's get into the early life of Hubert Gerald Jr., 
Hit it, Beth! Hubert Geralds Jr. was born on November 13th, 1964. He grew up on Staten Island. We don't know much about his early life. All we could find was that his father abandoned the family when Hubert was very little and he was abused by his stepfather's mother's boyfriend. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if she was actually married to him. Okay. Hubert dropped out of public school for students with learning disabilities when he was 14 years old. At the age of 16, he was arrested as part of a purse snatching ring. In 1990, he was convicted of robbery and served two years in prison in New York. So he didn't have much of an education. No. He dropped out of school when he was 14. Yeah. Yeah. So he didn't have a lot of opportunities. You're right. Yes. After being paroled in June of 1992 when he was 27, Gerald's moved to Chicago and lived with family. In January of 1993, he was charged with residential burglary. He pleaded guilty and was sentenced to five years in prison. He was then paroled on October 29th, 1994, and moved in with his brother. 1994 is the year that Joe Byron drafted the 1994 crime bill. Oh, wow. Yeah. That's that's nuts. It It seems like yesterday, and it was a long time ago. You know? I know. Well, I, it, interestingly, I I agree. It does seem like yesterday because I do remember it being in, hearing grown ups talking in the '90s when I was a kid about, yeah. wow, these people aren't really serving that much time. Oh, thank goodness for this crime yeah. bill. <laughs> yeah, and then it get you get to three strikes, you're out, and pff, it's off to the races. Wow. Now. now we have an yeah. uncontrollable population of incarcerated people. Yeah, it's nuts. Yeah. Um, but Hubert was described by some neighbors as quote. Strange and kind of slow, unquote. We don't we don't say that anymore, but that's what people used to say. That's what people used to say. Yeah. yeah. So he had a reputation for being streetwise and docile when sober, but unpredictable and violent when not. His IQ had been tested as low as 59, but um, IQ tests are racist bullshit. Anyway. Yeah. <laughs> he was a handyman who liked to tinker in the basement of his brother's home. And he held short-lived jobs at local grocery stores. He often hung out at the laundromat and would offer to carry groceries home for women. Sounds benign enough, no? Yeah, it does sound benign, right? Yeah. Three AM, the comedy horror podcast that holds weekly gatherings around the campfire. Let me tell you what you're going to get. You're going to hear stories about demonic possessions, prison stabbings, skinwalkers, glitches in the Matrix, cult leaders, missing 411, night marchers, Operation Paperclip, Mesopotamian devil worship, and so many monsters it'll give Kanye West a runaway for his money. Pop and meme culture also aren't off topic. A camp where laughs and scares are constantly competing for first place. We're just a group of friends trying to bust each other's balls, find the best stories, and expand the circle in the process. 3 a.m., the comedy horror podcast, not for the faint or fragile of heart. Let's go. Something is creeping in. Don't follow it down. Let me introduce you to Barry Clue, an authorized financial advisor from New Zealand and a very special kind of stain. On humanity. He was a very uh, knowledgeable young guy. He was a registered financial advisor. The type of guy that was bending over backwards to help you. Now you could be forgiven for thinking that Barry sounds like a great guy. And you'd be right. Well, right up until the point when you're wrong. It was all fictitious. You stole from my son who has a disability. Chris never knew. He died believing that we're all taken care of. A psychopath is somebody who lacks empathy, acts impulsively. I think there's a strong case that Barry might be all of those things, actually. To find out how Barry Clue stole over $15 million from 81 victims, subscribe to Clueless, the long con. That's Clueless, spelt K-L-O-O-G-H-L-E-S-S. So let's get into the timeline. What do you got for us, Beth? From September 1993 to June 1999, Chicago police accumulated a large number of unsolved murders in Englewood, and all of them were similar to each other. The victims were poor Black women. Most of them were sex workers. 
The bodies were found in warehouses and uninhabited buildings, deserted streets and dumpsters. Almost all of them had been raped. Sergeant Jack Ridges, a Chicago homicide investigator, kept a database with information on 66 women who had died in Chicago since 1989. What linked the women was not necessarily the manner of their deaths, but the fact that they were sex workers with substance abuse issues. Ridges began collecting information on the murders in 1992 when he was assigned to assist Los Angeles police investigating the murder of a sex worker by a sailor who had lived in Englewood. Los Angeles police wanted to know whether a connection might exist between the sailor and any unsolved homicides in Chicago. Ridges never found a link that would help the Los Angeles police, but along the way, he came to the realization that there were a lot of unsolved murders that fit a pattern. Six detectives were assigned exclusively to work with Ridges on the murders. What police did not know is that there were at least two serial killers working in Englewood between 1993 and 1999. One of them was Andre Crawford, who we covered back on episode 204, Mm. and another was Hubert Gerald's. So Gerald's MO was to offer drugs to a woman, get her into a secluded place, choke her into unconsciousness, and then rape her. If afterwards the woman was still alive, he strangled or suffocated her to death. On December 21st, 1994, The partially skeletonized body of 18-year-old Rhonda King was found on the third floor of a boarded-up building. Rhonda's body was unclothed, except for a coat and cushion covering her head. The body was in a bad state of decomposition, and the medical examiner could find no obvious signs of trauma. However, a bloodstain had been found about two feet from Rhonda's head, and there appeared to be bloodstains on her clothing. Although her cause of death was listed as undetermined, Police suspected foul play, but absent any evidence, the case went cold. On December 22nd, 1994, the body of 37-year-old Dorothea Withers was found. Dorothea was quiet and kept to herself. She had a day job, but according to neighbors, she worked as a sex worker in the evenings. She'd been burglarized, and afterwards, she moved out of the apartment that she lived in, but the neighbors did not know where she'd gone. On March 14, 1995, Alonda Tart, 23, was found dead. She had been strangled to death and her body left in an abandoned building. Alonda left home at the tender age of 14, so a baby when she left. Yeah. And ended up on the streets and fell into a heroin addiction. The men that she hung out with often turned violent and she'd at times been beaten and threatened to death. So when her body was found on West 54th Street, She was chalked up as just another victim of the streets. On March 26, 1995, Gerald's reported finding the body of Joyce Wilson, 28. So Hubert Gerald himself reported. Oh, what a good Samaritan. Yeah. Um, Joyce Wilson's body was found in a broken down truck a few blocks from Gerald's house. Joyce was the mother of four children, but she could not beat her addiction. Her mother and eight brothers and sisters warned her that she might turn up dead one day. And they begged her to get clean. They obviously loved her. Yeah. But she she just couldn't do it. Addiction is hard. Yeah. It is so fucking hard. So if she couldn't beat it, it's not because she wasn't strong enough or she didn't have enough willpower or any bullshit like that. It's just really hard. Just had her too Mm -hmm. hard. Yeah. Gerald's was questioned by police, but was not a suspect at the time. He later bragged to a neighbor that he was the killer, but would never be caught because he was careful not to leave behind any evidence. Sure, Gerald. Um, (laughs) Okay. The neighbor didn't believe him. On April 14th, 1995, Clashon Hopes, 25, spent the evening smoking crack with Gerald's. Afterwards, she and Gerald's left her apartment on South Elizabeth Street in search of more drugs. They split up, she said, because she wanted to buy drugs with cash and he wanted to buy crack on credit. Bad business decision, bro. While Cl- <laughs> while Clashon was uh, walking by an alley, she was grabbed from behind. Quote, I was being lifted off the ground and started to black out, unquote. It's terrifying. Yeah, it is. She awakened in a van with Gerald's raping her. He had his hand on her throat and was startled to see that she'd woken up. Clashon managed to escape by diving headfirst into a piece of plywood taped over the doorframe of the van. Mm, wow. Wow. Pushing yeah. the board free and falling to the ground. Golly, she's like an action movie star. Yeah, no Oh shit. my gosh, way to go. 
So naked from the waist down, Hopes said she ran like hell to her home where police were called. She initially told several different and false versions of what had happened, and we can understand why. About that, she later said, quote, getting high was an immoral thing in my family, and I tried to hide it. I almost lost my life, and I was in jeopardy of losing my kids and everything around me, unquote. Yeah. I don't even need a culture corner. She explained. Yeah. Why? Yeah. Yeah. On June 7th, 1995, the partially clad body of Lovey Ford, 26, was found in some bushes near an elementary school. She had been strangled to death and was found by some seventh graders mm. playing baseball nearby. Oh, sad for everybody involved. Traumatizing. Yeah. yeah. In June of 1995, Millicent Jones, 25, known as Peanuts by her friends and family, disappeared. It wasn't unusual for Millicent, who had a history of drug use, to disappear for hours or days at a time to feed her habit. Millicent's mother described her as a sweet girl who never forgot a birthday, a holiday, or anything that pertained to her sons. So when she missed her son's first grade graduation, her mother and sisters knew that something was wrong. Mm. And on June 12th, 1995, Millicent was found dead. Mm. Um, I admire people who have that intuitive gift to just yeah. know. You know, they know just something's knew wrong. something yeah. was wrong. Yeah. I think something's wrong all the time. You do? Oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I, My daughter and I, when we call each other, because we're the same way, uh -huh. so I'll call her, and the first thing I'll say is, everything's fine. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> when my mom calls me, I'm like, oh, who died? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. I yeah. expect I expect the worst, but I, I want to be better at trusting my intuition, like Millicent's family. Yeah. So Mary Blackman, 42, was friends with Hubert Gerald's sister, Angela. Mary's children had all moved to Kansas, and they were trying to get her to move there, too, but she wanted to stay in Chicago. And my understanding is that she was staying at the Gerald's house. Yeah, so she's living at the house mm -hmm. where Hubert Gerald's lives. On June 17th, 1995, Angela, investigating the source of a foul odor, found Mary's body in a trash bin behind the Gerald's neighbor's house. Oh, my God. And she contacted authorities. To police, Angela described her brother Hubert as a drug addict who occasionally became violent when doing drugs. Doing drugs! Yeah, doing drugs! <laughs> <laughs> we haven't said that in a long time. Um, so just a few days earlier, he had come into her bedroom. She said he was high on drugs, looking crazy and foaming at the mouth. Yikes. Mm -hmm. That would be terrifying. Yes, you know, indeed. That's one of the reasons why I lock my bedroom door. You lock your bedroom door. Yeah. It's a habit because I was always afraid my brother was going to come into my room. Oh, Beth. And you still yeah. do it to this day. Yep. Wow. I think I think whatever you got to do. I mean, I lock all the doors behind me, but I, we, I don't necessarily lock the doors inside my house, but definitely the I outside do. ones. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, well, hashtag be like Beth. I say it all the time. <laughs> yeah. Just because he he also uh, did drugs. <laughs> did, did drugs. <laughs> oh, man. So uh, Gerald shook his sister mm -hmm. and demanded money. But she was able to fend him off with a razor blade. Wow. 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 Angela told police she believed that her brother might have been involved in the death of her friend, Mary Blackman. Mm, mm, mm. All right. Let's get into the investigation and the arrest. So one of the detectives on Sergeant Ridge's task force recognized Gerald's name as the person who in March had reported the murder of Joyce Wilson, who was 28 years old. Hmm. And Joyce's body was found in an abandoned truck. Then Clashan Hopes identified Gerald's as the assailant who had raped her on April 14th, 1995, and from whom she narrowly escaped. On June 19th, 1995, police interviewed Hubert Gerald's and under interrogation by police, Gerald's confessed. According to Gerald's confession, he didn't plan the attacks, but killed the women in fits of anger. So to me, it sounds like he wanted to have sex with them mm -hmm. and Killing them was like in his mind the only uh, way. An afterthought, yeah. Oh, okay, okay. So, like, say that again. I don't 
know that killing them was what got him off. Oh, because of all the articles you've read about this case that yeah, imply... I guess we'll yeah, we'll... I guess we'll get into it later. <laughs> yeah, sorry, That's I jumped okay. the gun. That's okay. So he was shown a photograph of Rhonda King, and Gerald said Rhonda was one of the women that he strangled and killed, and he provided a written statement to that effect. But also during the interrogation, he said, quote, wait a minute, I didn't kill all these women. There's <laughs> other people out there killing women, unquote. <laughs> and doesn't it, it, doesn't it make you wonder, wait, like, is there a club? A club? Yeah. Of people ca- like, how do you, how do you know club. that? Like, well, he knows that if he knows that there's 10 women who are dead and he only killed six of them, then obviously somebody else is killing the other four. But is it a friend of yours? Friend of yours, Gerald? It could be. It could be, hmm? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so at the same time, a man named Derek Flewellen was arrested and charged with the murder of Lovey Ford and another woman named Sherry Hunt, who was 35, when she died. So now let's get into the trial. What the what, Beth? Gerald's defense lawyer said he was mentally challenged, had a mental age of eight, and was a child in a man's body. They argued that Gerald, who nodded off through much of the two-week trial, had also suffered a childhood of savage abuse at the hands of his mother's boyfriend. But Dr. Albert Stipes, a psychiatrist for the prosecution, testified that Gerald was a malingerer who faked mental illness and, quote, played dumb, unquote, to avoid punishment. And I will also say that sometimes mental health and medical practitioners just refuse to see the symptoms that a black person or a brown person might be exhibiting. Right. Studies show just yeah, call them malingerers. Yes, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Doctors think that black people have more nerve endings and have higher thresholds of pain, all kinds of bullshit like that. So Dr. Stipes, um appreciate know about you. appreciate yeah. your opinion, but yeah. So anyway, I'm and I'm not sympathizing like I don't have sympathy for Gerald for being a, a murderer, but he right. clearly had Issues. deficits. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I don't see how somebody could have could see that as faking it. But prosecutors described Gerald's as, quote, an ugly, violent force, unquote. They said that when he killed the women, he used a technique that he called the guardian angel chokehold, which he had learned in a self-defense class in his native New York. I was wondering what he was doing in a self-defense class. Like, you know, maybe trying to learn how to accost people or better attack people. I was just really curious by this by this fact, this little fact in the I story. I mean, anybody could use a self-defense class, I guess, you know? I guess. I mean, if you're attacking people, you have to defend yourself as well. I guess. He just <laughs> seems like an unlikely client. <laughs> candidate for yeah, that kind of Yeah, candidate for that kind of class. Who knows? Maybe somebody signed him up for it. Or who oh. knows? Or uh, maybe when he was a kid. Oh, uh, maybe. Maybe. You know. Maybe. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so Clashawn Hopes testified during the trial. In other testimony, Jacqueline Kelly, a former South Sad resident who had moved to Minnesota, testified that in March or April of 1995, she heard Gerald's claim responsibility for several murders of women in the neighborhood. But at the time, she believed he was kidding. Jacqueline said, quote, he said he was just too smart for the police. (laughs) He said they had no evidence. He said he made it look like a rape. And then police would think it was just a rapist, not a serial killer, unquote, which is pretty dumb. (laughs) I've done it. Um, (laughs) But you just confessed and your words are also evidence. So also they're dead. So so... that's kind of what serial killers do. Yeah, I'm sorry, (laughs) but the math ain't mathin', Gerald. (laughs) Uh, So she also said that Gerald's told them that he had been questioned by police but released. And he showed them the release papers. Look at me. I've got a release (laughs) ticket. After the three-week trial and 12 hours of deliberation, on November 13th, 1997, the day of his 33rd birthday, Gerald's was convicted of first-degree murder. He also was convicted of sexually assaulting one victim and of the attempted murder of Clashawn Hopes. The jury found nothing in mitigation to preclude imposition of the death penalty. And on January 9th, 1998, he was sentenced to death.
Do you enjoy science, spooky stories, and all things paranormal? We do too. While we would love for most paranormal stories to be true, we are here to tell you that they probably aren't. But that doesn't make them any less fun to speculate about. We are the Spooky Science Sisters podcast. In this podcast, we bring you bi-weekly discussions on possible scientific explanations behind the supernatural. Backed up by research articles and other credible sources, we do deep dives into things like archaeology and physics and share in-depth discussions with topic experts. Visit us at SpookySciencesisters.com to listen to a couple of skeptics debunk some of your favorite alien encounters, cryptid sightings, and ghost stories with science, sass, and a significant amount of laughter. Thank you, and stay spooky. So now let's get into where are they now? Tell us, Beth. Gerald is currently incarcerated at the Menard Correctional Center in Chester, Illinois. He is serving a life sentence and is ineligible for parole. In December of 1998, Chicago police, with the assistance of the Federal Bureau of Investigation, began comparing DNA recovered from murder victims in Englewood. The seminal DNA recovered in many of these cases was the same. In 1999, Derek Flewellen was acquitted of the murder of Lovey Ford. DNA tests of semen taken from Lovey Ford matched that of Hubert Gerald's. Sherry Hunt, the other woman he was charged with murdering, had been found dead in her apartment, and there was no evidence that she was even murdered. Wow. Wow, wow, wow. I love DNA. DNA does it again. You know what? I got to do something over here. Excuse me. (sighs) Thanks, DNA. So Flewellen said that he was tortured and coerced by police officers to give false confessions. Remember what I was telling you about earlier? Yep. And he had an injured foot at the time of his interrogation and alleged that an officer stomped on his injured foot and proceeded to crush the wheels of a metal chair into his wounds. Jesus Christ. He said that seven detectives beat him over the course of 36 hours, ignoring his pleas for a lawyer, sleep, and pain medication, while threatening that CPS would take his girlfriend's infant son away from her. Following this barrage, he quote-unquote confessed. Mm. Unable to afford bond, Flewellen spent four and a half years in Cook County Jail. So jail is detention. That's where they keep you before you're even like convicted. It's just to hold you there until your trial. So four years when you're supposed to have a speedy trial is incredibly fucked up. Yeah. So Cook County Jail, before a judge, found him not guilty. And even after, each of the officers who interrogated Flewellen testified against him. Mm. Six months after he was set free, Flewellen filed a civil complaint against the detectives. Although the officers denied his accusations, the city of Chicago eventually settled Flewellen's claims of false arrest and malicious prosecution for $250,000 in 2002. Mm-hmm. Not enough, uh, no. but there At you go. At least it's something. Yeah. In January of 2000, Andre Crawford, who we covered in episode 204, confessed to Rhonda King's murder, and his version of events matched the crime scene, whereas Gerald's version of events did not. And subsequent DNA testing identified Crawford's DNA and excluded Gerald's in that murder. On February 10th, 2000, prosecutors moved to vacate Gerald's conviction for Rhonda King's murder. Prosecutors also vacated the other five convictions. Gerald's then pleaded guilty to the other five murders and was sentenced to life in prison without parole. A five-month investigation revealed that five of the officers accused of using torture to coerce 11 false confessions remained on the force. Three had actually been promoted. More money and more power is what they earned for this fuck up. Wow. Fuckery, yeah. Um, So now we're going to get into our takes and what we think made Gerald's snap. Yeah. What are your thoughts, Beth? Well, a lot of the articles that I read mentioned that Gerald's had a paraphilia, which is defined as a condition characterized by abnormal sexual desires, typically involving extreme or dangerous activities. Mm. Specifically in Gerald's case, he wanted to have sex with women while they were sleeping. Mm -hmm. And just to be clear, fetishes are, quote, non-traditional sexual interests or behaviors or kinks that are for a particular individual, a deep and abiding and possibly even necessary element of sexual arousal 
an activity, unquote. Mm -hmm. Paraphilias are fetishes that have escalated in ways that have resulted in negative life consequences. Uh So they're they're different. They're different. One is harmful. Yes, exactly. And the other one can not be. Yeah. And um, not here to kink shame. Just got to say that. No, that's why I wanted to make that claim. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) (laughs) So so there's that. It is also alleged that he was beaten by his stepfather. Mm -hmm. So I'm sure there was anger. Yeah. He was allegedly mentally challenged and he probably had no idea what to do with his feelings. Yeah. And probably had no help trying to figure them out as a boy and a young man. Yeah. Um, now that you say that, the fact that he may have been beaten by his stepfather, coupled with the abandonment by his biological father, biological father I, yeah. I'm sure played a role in his development, his social and emotional learning and resiliency. And the idea that he had this compulsion to have intercourse with bodies that were Asleep not moving or yeah. not moving. <laughs> yeah. um, it it kind of to me seems like he was afraid of like being hurt or abandoned. Yeah, you know, it's kind of like um, what's his face? Oh my god, I can't remember the name of the murderer. Are you gonna name one of the um, whites? The famous yeah, whites? Yeah, one of the whites. Famous, famous white murderer. <laughs> 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 Which one? Oh, I can't. I remember. <laughs> Which one? There's so many. I mean, uh, oh, I can't. Shit. I can't well, think. I can't, I've actually remember. Dahmer. Jeffrey Dahmer. Yes. Jeffrey Dahmer. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So he also did not want to have a like a have to talk to people. Yeah, it was hard you know? for them because yeah. of how they grew up and not having again social and emotional like fortitude. Right. And Jeffrey Dahmer's solution was to try to make zombies, whereas well, this guy can you he... can you rule it out as as a, as a suggestion? <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm totally kidding. That that was a bad joke. I'm like sweating, like thinking of people hating now my guts thinking, after yeah. I said that. <laughs> so uh, Jeffrey Dahmer's solution was to create zombies, mm-hmm. and this guy's solution was to. Um, choke them until they pass out Mm -hmm. and i think like i said before that i think killing them was an afterthought yeah like like an unintended consequence an unintended consequence or possibly done so that they couldn't talk yeah yeah the fact that he confessed to a murder that he did not commit was at first weird to me but then in the face of this being chicago Commander Berg, Chicago, and his police oh, regime. Yeah. Nah, it's no surprise. Yeah. It's no surprise that um, somebody who was completely innocent got caught up in, in this case, too. I feel really bad for that guy who spent four years in yeah. jail and Awful. couldn't get out just because he didn't have the money for bail. Now, um, this is Chicago. I personally find it hard to trust the word of any public official in Chicago, police, mayors, prosecutors, Rob Bl- Blagojevich, LOL. <laughs> Um, (laughs) and I feel really badly for the women who were victims of Gerald's, but they were also victims of society and circumstances like not being born into the dominant caste or class, AKA white and wealthy, you know, poverty was a factor. Lack of resources and support was a factor, not just for their mental health, because a lot of them seem to be suffering from addiction issues and engaged in the survival industry, but who helped, you know, who was there to help a young Rhonda or a young Dorothea or a young Alanda or a young Joyce or a young Millicent or Marie or Lovey when they needed employment or a coat on a cold day? Chicago gets cold as fuck. Or a meal or health care. Like if they had access to those things, I don't even know if this would be a case we would be talking about. Yeah. And people don't just become addicted to drugs for no reason. Yeah. Or turn to survival work for no reason. Yeah. And I got to say this, it's election season and every politician is like, I'm going to be so tough. I'm going to be the toughest on this and tough on that. I'm going to crush that problem's balls. (laughs) And it's like, can we just... Like, how about some humanity? What if we try something different? Maybe this toughness thing isn't working. Yeah, the ninety-four seem crime like bill. <laughs> yeah, was like forty years ago, and or thirty years ago. And are we any better from this 
ramping up of toughness. People need like care, humanity, respect, grace, all these things. So anyway, all these numerous systems failed, I think, everybody in the story along the way. Yeah. Agree. I already talked about it all. But I, I hate to say this, but I, you know, I have a young son and we are hard on, on my son only because, you know, if a police officer asks him a question and he doesn't answer right away, he does his little, gosh, mom, or ignores the police officer, he could be dead. You know, he could, he right. could end up it's in jail scary. and it, it's terrifying. And so I feel really, really bad for the young black boy that Gerald was. He wasn't even safe in his own home. And he became a young person and eventually an adult who harmed other vulnerable people in his community. And, you know, they basically had him doing the cha-cha slide from one incarceration to the next. And he never got what he needed either. Yeah. Rehabilitation. I mean, if you're going to put somebody away... Are we going to do anything to make them better? I don't, I don't know. Uh, I, I, yeah, exactly. That's what I always think of. Like, okay, you want these people to be punished, but they're going to come out eventually. Exactly. Do you, wanna, and do you want them to come out worse? Mm -hmm. oh, yeah. Do we want to put our citizens into a place that's going to make them worse and then release them and have them be more damaged and inflict more harm on our communities. You know what I mean? It doesn't, the, the yeah. math ain't mathing and we have to do something different. And uh, this is no secret. I'm a prison abolitionist and a police abolitionist, but <laughs> yeah, get out of here. And I know that there's a lot of love for the city of Chicago, but I also think there is a lot not to love. You know, the Chicago is no stranger to corruption, under resourcing of its marginalized communities and also ignoring and minimizing the value and contributions that those marginalized communities are doing within their own communities to protect and support and uplift themselves. So this case had all the themes to talk about. I am dying to know what you fruities think. And uh, you know where to find us. Yeah, get at us. So now we're going to move on to how not to get murdered. <laughs> If you love true crime and you don't want to die, here's a tip for you. <laughs> <laughs> so this segment is not intended to be victim blaming. We thought of this segment because I read somewhere that a lot of people listen to true crime because they want to know what they can do to be safer. This is not meant to blame the victims. It's just learning from other people's experiences. So I was just going to say, during our Fruit Loops happy hour this week, um, one of our fruities told us about a woman that was violently attacked and stabbed with a knife in a public, crowded park in the middle of the day. Yeah, crazy. And y'all, yeah, it's it's crazy, but it's getting warm out here. We all want to get out, get our summer bodies. You know, it's, a, it's about to be a hot girl spring and a hot girl summer. But if you can, if you want to get out, I think it's a good idea to take a buddy. Take a buddy yeah. with you on your jogs, on your hikes, and a buddy can be a doggy as well. Yeah. But, you know, if you are alone, keep your head on a swivel. Don't wear headphones if you are alone. And pack a whistle. Pack something that will you can use to alert people around you and something you can use to defend yourself. And that is my tip. Put it all in your all fanny right. pack and go. There you go. <laughs> And if you have any tips, feel free to get at us as well. Yeah. Now we're going to get into the shout out portion of our show where we shout out any content by or about people of color, by or about any marginalized folks or any true crime goodies. And I this I think this um, checks all the boxes. The Color Purple. I think it's an Academy Award nominated film the first time and the second time. But I actually don't know. <laughs> but it is streaming on Max and it stars... Danielle from Tasty from uh, Orange is the New Black. Oh, okay. Fantasia. Taraji P. Henson. Whoopi Goldberg is in it. Halle Bailey. The Black Little Mermaid is in it. And it's the musical. And my poor black ass would, would never be able to see it on Broadway because I can't afford it. But I'm so glad it's it's on the silver screen, if you will. Or, yeah, or, that's really cool. Yeah. And so I never I've seen the color purple so many times. It, it was on TV all the time when I was a kid. Yeah. And I never realized that it's a story about black, like so many things, but including black queerness, black feminism, black love. 
and Black liberation. Yeah. And the music is beautiful. And it, I, I was... <laughs> I was like rejoicing watching it. So that's awesome. That's what I got. Yeah. What do you got? Um, I just wanted to shout out a creator on TikTok. Yeah. Named Risa Tisa. Yes. Yes. And we talked about this. You and I did. Uh huh. Not me and the fruities. Oh. But <laughs> I thought we we did talk about it at the we did happy talk hour. about it at the happy hour, yeah. but not to, not to like the fruities at large. Oh. <laughs> That's true. That's true. <laughs> I'm just being silly. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> she did a series. There's like over 50 episodes called Who the Fuck Did I Marry? Mm-hmm. And she tells a story about how she married a compulsive liar mm-hmm. or a pathological liar. Mm-hmm. Sorry. Mm-hmm. And how they met mm-hmm. and how it happened mm-hmm. and everything. Mm-hmm. And the reason why she did the series, and which is like, I don't know how many minutes long, like eight hours long or yeah. something. Yeah, it's long. It's long. Yeah. Try and listen to it's it at long. double speeds if you, if you really want to get through it. Yeah, I listened to the whole thing one right after the Regular other. Regular speed? Regular speed. Wow, yeah. Beth. Yeah. Oh, my. You are my hero in so many ways. <laughs> wow. But she said she did the series because she thought if even one woman mm-hmm. listening to her story was like, you know, I see those red flags too. Yeah. Then it would be worth it. Yeah. Yeah. That's I mean, that's that's the whole point of that's storytelling, right? So our stories yeah. are so valuable. And I'm glad that Risa Tisa shared hers because it had me and the internet in a chokehold. And yes, uh for sure. and Beth as well. Yeah. <laughs> so do you wanna what's her at? Risa Tisa. Okay. So those shout outs uh to recap are the color purple, the new one streaming on Max as well as a good follow on TikTok, Instagram too? I don't know if she's on Instagram. You know, I don't know. I, 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 I know watched she's her for on, sure on TikTok. TikTok. Risa yeah. Tisad, at Risa M. Tisa. Look at that. Oh my gosh. It's the <laughs> end of the episode. It is. Oh, well, we've got to go, but <laughs> we'll be back. And until yes. then, Beth, where can the people find us? Our website is fruitloopspod.com and we use Fruit Loops Pod for all of our social media. The footnotes for each episode can be found on our website. Plus, check it out for the different ways that you can support the show. Also, join us on Patreon, where we have literally hundreds of hours of bonus content. You can also support us by supporting our sponsors or by giving us a five-star review. Five, Five stars, stars only, only, please. please. <laughs> also, don't forget to subscribe. That's right. So listen up close, y'all. This is a weekly podcast and new episodes drop every Thursday. So until next time, look alive, y'all. It's crazy out there. Got me mid vape. Sorry. <laughs> um, shot town. Show us how you get down. Uh, no. <laughs> I de- Are you crazy? You don't want me to do that, but okay, I guess so. Anyway, no sorry, bueno. Just, no bueno. Me no me no me gusta. Um, <laughs> okay. <clears throat> Here, one more tea sip. This is actually really good. <laughs> Not too hot, not too cold, perfect temperature. Just right. Just right. All right. <clears throat> Which is pretty dumb. I've yeah. done it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> on November 13th, which is his birthday. Oh, wow. wow. Hmm. On 1997, the day. Oh, it is. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Beth, you on forgot November- you brilliantly <laughs> already forgot. inserted that? Already put that in there. Okay. <laughs> blah, 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 death deaths <laughs> thank you mouth on february 10th sorry <laughs> <laughs>
My mouth stopped for a second. <laughs> What's wrong with our <laughs> mouths? Oh, no. <laughs> this tea is really good. I don't know if I've said this before. It's like this Caribbean tea. Ooh. It just says Caribbean. And I don't, huh. I don't know what's in it, but oh, man, you had the right combination of sugar and honey. Oh, it's off nice. the chain. Uh, don't tell my dentist. <laughs> Look at me. I've got a release <laughs> ticket. <laughs> this reminds me of the SNL sketch. What they're like, try on these Trump sneakers. You won't win, but you'll believe that you did. (laughs) (laughs) That's hilarious. (laughs) Anyway. That's pretty fucked up. Yeah. Yeah. America. Thanks, Pep. Good one. (laughs) Sorry, I had to cough. Hey, no problem. You know what? (laughs) I was going to like just blow up for no reason, but I'm not very good at that. (laughs) <laughs> how dare you uh, I, how dare you I, cough <laughs> yeah you bitch this podcast is over that's it i said good day sir <laughs> good day <laughs> here you want to just do it yeah. wah, wah, wah. <laughs> just do a shaboim wah, wah, wah. a zabarude just do any any scatting wah, 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 wah. yeah yeah wah. Yeah. That was a nice podcast. Okay. That was a nice podcast. Yeah, you did good, Beth. You, you did good, Beth. Um, so, also, Phoebe Ooh. Judge, be our friend. <laughs> we talk just like you. <laughs> or we can. We can at any point. And when we join you, someday on Criminal. <laughs> this is Criminal. Yeah. Uh, I'm Phoebe I'm Judge. Phoebe Judge. And this is criminal. <laughs> <laughs> you nailed it. <laughs> With the Lucky Land Slots, you can get lucky just about anywhere. This is your captain speaking. Uh, we've got clear runway and the weather's fine, but we're just going to circle up here a while and uh, get lucky. No, no, nothing like that. It's just these cash prizes add up quick. So I suggest you sit back, keep your tray table upright, and start getting lucky. Play for free at LuckyLandSlots.com. Are you feeling lucky? No purchase necessary. Void where prohibited by law. 18 plus terms and conditions apply. See website for details. Top of the day, everyone. I'm Nisha. And I'm Buddha Badass. And we're the hosts of Hot Garbage True Crime Edition. Do you guys like true crime? I really don't. I feel like you force me on this show every freaking time I come here. Do you guys enjoy listening to victims and murderers and protest stuff? People that are sick in the freaking head. That's who likes it. That's who likes it. Well, if you like that kind of stuff, then you should totally check us out. I mean, every single Thursday, we drop the most hottest cases and we have fun while doing it. Uh, You you drop the most hottest cases? You drop murder and death. Kill. (laughs) How many people can actually say that they have fun while listening to a true crime podcast? And I feel like that's what we do here. So you're just not going to listen to me now? I'm just going to say this and you're not going to listen to me? And you know what? Our listeners are not just our listeners, but they're our friends and our trash pandas. We the, love you guys. They're a lot. And I will agree to that part, but I'm still just mad at you for just not talking to me. They're paying you this well to say all this. So check out Hot Garbage on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, anywhere that you listen to podcasts. Check us out every single Thursday. A new episode drops. I officially hate this commercial. Awesome, real.